feeling connected. I follow Randy and his wife June up the winding Highway 150 to Ojai. His wife drives like a lunatic, and I have to be Mario Andretti to keep up. Randy is an actor friend and aspiring writer who attends a bi-monthly peyote ceremony in the Ojai Valley for his Native American church. He tells me this is the most profound spiritual experience of his life and urges me to check it out. How can I resist such an invitation? Most profound spiritual experience is just what the doctor ordered. I have always loved and respected Native American pathways and appreciated their tradition and deep connection to the earth and nature. I did harbor a little bit of trepidation at the thought of ingesting peyote. I am generally a person who avoids drugs and alcohol, not because I'm a prude or a square, I just never liked the idea of that kind of unnatural escape. As Randy's wife, June, NASCARs the twisting road, I begin to feel nauseating fear building in my guts. I'm concerned I might be socially pressured to take the drug or fall victim to some Indian fa pa if I was not careful. I didn't want to embarrass Randy and make everyone feel uncomfortable being the only one who may not fully partake in the ritual. On the drive up, Randy and June pull alongside of the road and Randy tells me he saw Coyote cross the road, which is a good omen for tonight's ceremony. Coyote, he explains, symbolizes transformation and spiritual renewal. A red-tailed hawk is also spotted on the drive, which means freedom and clarity of self-awareness. They fail to mention, though, what the omen is for all the crushed bunnies, squirrels, raccoons, and other small varmints June leaves in her inner nascent wake. Randy is small and wiry, with an enormous head. His acting skills are unparalleled, but his writing is average. His wife is a very plain, blonde woman with a low, subdued energy level, and she seems to hold in a lot of emotion. Perfectly contrasting Randy, who is very flamboyant and outspoken. I had originally assumed he was gay at our first encounter, and was utterly baffled to learn he actually married a woman with real parts and everything. At a rural site off the highway, we collect long timber poles to construct the TV. Randy ducks out of the work by chatting incessantly with anyone who will listen or by making himself look busy by kicking around in the dust and removing things from the soles of his shoes. His wife vanishes for a while, also opting out of the hard labor, which is reserved for the men of the tribe. We share a peace pipe as we construct the teepee to appease the spirits. It is not actually a pipe, but a small, flat cigarette tied together with string. I am the fifth in line to take a puff. I have never smoked anything, so I am clueless how to do this. I just play along, trying my best to look reverential, so as not to piss off the road chief Rick, a massive, kindly man with a barrel chest and giant brown hands and calves. Appearing quiet and humble when you meet him on the street, Rick is larger than life at the ceremony, a gargantuan personality who seems to spiritually come alive in his element and drift back into obscurity when trying to reassimilate into the white man's world. I catch Rick alone for a moment and deem it a good time to slip him the big question. Hey man, I had a vision one time. I was meditating and saw myself on fire. You've been doing this a lot. Ever seen anything like that? I have. Like what's it mean? It was really intense. Kind of freaked me out. You ever hear of sacred fire? Rick says, unloading long poles from the back of his pickup. No, not really. Fire is at the center of all paths. Surrender to it. The teepee is constructed, and other attendants begin to trickle in. It is an earthy crowd, many of the people not looking like they hold down regular jobs. Besides the chief, his sister, the fireman, and the drum man, everyone else is white. I roam off by myself to walk along a river and get in touch with nature and God. I sit quietly by myself and do some simple meditations and prayers. To get the most out of this experience, I want to be open and humble. I know my cynicism is my own worst enemy and don't want to spoil the experience. This is obviously a very sacred ritual to these people, and to harbor negative thoughts has always been my undoing. Alone, out here in the forest, away from everyone, I feel peaceful and connected. I notice a spotted hawk perched on the roots of a tree that has been swept over in the recent rains. I remove my shoes and cross the river, climbing up on the opposite bank to get a look at the hawk. Oddly, he doesn't fly off. He doesn't seem to mind my approach at all. I keep thinking maybe this is another sign. This great bird telling me that everything is a-okay, and I'm actually close to nature and connected with Mother Earth. 
as opposed to being the neurotic white guy bound fast to his schizophrenic material longings. I walk right up to the hawk, and to my astonishment, he doesn't move, only rivets me with his stern gaze. I peer around, wondering if this is someone's domesticated pet. The hawk is massive and beautiful, with a white tail, spotted wings, and bright orange eyes. I pish at him to show I am not here to harm him. Pishing is a high-pitched, squeaky sound bird watchers use to connect with birds. The hawk tilts his head sideways inquisitively when I make the call. He doesn't show even the slightest hint of fear. I look at his wings and talons to see if he is injured but find no signs of external damage. I gaze around again wondering if this is some joke or someone is taping a hidden camera show. I actually expect the owner to come running around the corner yelling, Get away from my bird, jerk! I move a few inches closer, making another pishing sound. He stays in that exact spot, only shuffling his talons a little on the branch. I hold out my index finger, as you might do with a parrot when you want him to perch on you. I think of the majestic thrill of being connected to this great raptor and having him sit on my finger. He just watches my finger, deeply interested. I move it toward his spotted white belly, pishing quietly again. He looks into my eye as if he has known me for ages. He sees through all my insecurities, my limitations, my human frailties. For him, I am only another creature of the forest. I represent no predatory threat or challenge. I think of the great St. Francis of Assisi and his amazing spiritual advancement where he could commune with wildlife and they would follow him around like Dr. Doolittle. I understand when you are in tune with the divine, nature automatically obeys. I begin to sense that I, myself, despite my failings and cynicism, and perhaps truly a spiritually advanced soul who has finally attained mastery over beasts of the field and birds of the sky, I move my index finger right up to the spotted hawk's belly, pressing it against his downy feathers. My eyes are like poached eggs, a kid at his first big Christmas. Then he pecks the shit out of me. He freaking destroys my finger. He grips it in his razor-sharp beak and doesn't let go for what seems like an eternity. The hawk issues a piercing shriek and flies off, brushing my cheek with his wing as he goes. For a moment I am stunned. I can't fathom what has just happened. We were getting along so well. My finger is throbbing. The bird has instantly shattered my delusion of being at one with nature. I look up and catch a glimpse of him disappearing over the tree line. What an asshole. You build up a man's hopes like that, then yank the rug out from under his feet. I hold my bleeding finger under the freezing water of the creek. There is a gash right at the joint that oozes blood. The pain continues to throb dully. In reflection, I wasn't really sure what my intention was at having a wild hawk perch on my finger, and after about 20 seconds, after I get over the shock of it, the whole idea seems rather idiotic. Completely idiotic. What the hell was I thinking? Ever notice how lots of things don't seem that idiotic until you do the idiotic thing and look back and go, hey, that was really freaking idiotic. Later that night, inside the teepee, the fireman burns wood in the center of the dirt floor with cedar incense, which is supposed to curb the feelings of nausea, which can accompany ingesting peyote, the key ingredient being mescaline. We sit in a wide circle around the fire. I was told to bring a few pillows and blanket, but I have forgotten. I use my sweatshirt to pad my seat. For now, this suffices. Rick, the road chief, starts off with a short prayer. I am going into my place of worship. Be with us tonight, O Creator. I end up being seated right next to Rick and his sister, Glenda, a heavy-set, simple woman who smiles a lot but doesn't say much. She passes me this tea that tastes like clay, and I take a sip and pass it. They begin chanting as the drum man beats the drum. The tea is passed again, and I take another sip. This tea seems to have a relaxing effect as I can feel my pulse rate slow, the thrumming of the blood in my veins and my neck keeping beat with the steady thud of the drum. A warm, mellow feeling washes over my body, blanketing every fiber in a dull, milky contentedness. Glenda passes me peyote, which resembles thick chunks of a dark-colored mushroom. I notice everyone wolfing this stuff down like it's going out of style. I look at Randy as he sways and chants, 
his eyes closed in some kind of deep trance. The humming vibrations of the chanting bores deep in my chest. I can feel my ribs quivering. I try to play along as the fireman is now using the flaming coals to fashion amazing designs on the floor of the teepee. He creates a mountain, then what looks like a coyote, then an inverted deer. Glenda keeps passing me peyote, noticing my constant squirming as the pain in my knees and ankles from sitting so long in one spot grows unbearable. Take more peyote, it will help relax you, she whispers intensely. I am relaxed. Don't I look like I'm relaxed? She didn't know I was stuffing the peyote under my sweater. After a while, I have a big pile of this stuff under me, and I am worried how I'm going to dispose of it before the chief notices this and gives me a good box to the ear. At this point, an alarming number of the congregation begin to vomit into the dirt in front of them. Randy has explained this is people upchucking their sins and impurities, a direct result of the peyote ingestion, which forces everyone to face their own hidden demons. For now, I am okay with my sins, demons, and whatnot, just so long as I don't have to hurl my guts out in front of complete strangers on the dirt floor of this teepee. This only proves to heighten my fear of consuming the drug. The drum finally reaches me. Each person has a turn to pound on it and do their own personal chant. Everyone gets into the groove and knows the lingo, letting the great spirit guide their words and song. When the drum comes to me, I kind of look around for some guidance, but no one offers any. The chief's sister motions to the drum as I sit in dumb silence, holding it between my knees like my pecker. Finally, I belt out the only Indian chant I know from childhood. Hiawatha, 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 while banging on the drum like a cretin. A few white people shoot me scornful looks like they think I'm not being serious. No one else seems to notice or care, or are too embarrassed or stoned to look at me and make a scene. Some are busy vomiting, and for a moment, I think this is a direct result of my pathetic chant. I look at Randy to make sure he isn't giving me the stink eye, and fortunately, he is whacked out of his mind, swaying to and fro and humming something unintelligible. I am not sure if it is the strange tea, or the chanting, or the drumming, or the smoky ambiance, of the cedar incense, but there are rare moments when I am taken away, and I feel I am in touch with that deeper place I saw on Boney Mountain, when I looked inside myself in deep meditation. I suddenly feel at one with this motley group of white people who want to be Indians. Then I begin hallucinating. The fireman spins an incredible flaming eagle on the floor that rises up like the phoenix, out of the ashes, and hovers in the center of the teepee. I look around to see if anyone else notices this apparition, and everyone is off in dreamland, chanting and swaying. Then I am suddenly lifted off the dirt floor. I float up, a hundred feet off the ground. I extend my arms and drift up to the zenith of the teepee, with the smoke that is ebbing out into the night air, curling toward a coyote moon, blazing orange and diaphanous like the devil's iris. I peer down the little circle of celebrants beneath me, who look like squatting ants around a cigarette spark. The flaming eagle flaps his wings in dreamy slow-mo. Whoosh, whoosh. I feel my face wafted by the wind of his wings, cool, breezy, even though they are made of millions of tiny cherry red coal fragments. The eagle hovers close to my face and I look into his eye that transforms from flaming ember into an eagle eye full of wisdom and deep knowledge unblinking, eternal, the great god of light and air, the protector, vanquisher of darkness, giver of eternal peace. He conveys to me, through subtle intuition, that I am at one with the natural world, this earth, this realm, created by God for our majestic quest for truth and to find ourselves, which is really only finding God again. My God, it is so simple, so radiant. For one brief shining moment, I achieve absolute knowledge. The realization that I myself and the universe are one and God is everything. Then the great spirit eagle shows me atoms. And I see atoms in my bed while I sleep. And I see atoms of my bedspread, my pillow, my sheets, spinning, constantly turning and bouncing every which way. Then I am in a troller off Anacapa, 
my hook skimming the reefs for rockfish, bat ray, guitarfish, barracuda, sea scorpions, thresher sharks, and I see atoms too. Then I am running in a forest on Mount Rainier, chasing mighty elk through dense thickets, and there are atoms. Then I am riding the Bonsai Rapids on the King's River in a flimsy pool raft, and there are atoms. Then I am at work amid the boredom and monotony of my little desk, chair, and computer, and I see atoms. Then I am chasing a ball on a playing field, and people chase me with atoms. And I am floating in the blue waters of the cenote of Ick Kill, swimming amid the hundreds of tiny brown catfish, and I see atoms everywhere. And then I am in a vast sea of cars on the 405 freeway, moving along endlessly like the Amazon River, millions upon millions of cars, and I see atoms too. And I am walking amid the throngs of people at the fair in Ventura, or a soccer match with a crowd of 90,000 at the Coliseum who are atoms. Then I am sitting alone at night on my living room floor in my silence, and everything is atoms. Then I am a child lying in the snow of Olympia, Washington, waving my arms to make a snow angel, and it's all atoms. Everything atoms, always. The flaming eagle drifts back, smaller and smaller, floating down to a distant mountain, a thousand feet below, disappearing behind a snow-capped peak at the bottom of the teepee. Holy shit, they slipped me something in the tea. I dodge the peyote, and still my mind has conjured up multifarious visions. Sneaky Indians? Eight hours into the ceremony, I am no longer at one with the burning eagle, the atoms, or anything else. I've had it with the damn absolute knowledge. Screw the freaking eagle. My knees ache, my ankles ache, my stomach aches, my back aches. I only want to get the hell out of the friggin' teepee. When Randy originally told me about the ritual, I thought, all right, maybe an hour or two, your standard ceremony length. Get in, listen to the sermon, say some chants, dance around, we're good. We went into the teepee around dusk on Saturday night. We didn't get out until around 8 a.m. the next morning. Let me repeat that. 8 a.m. the next morning. No wonder you need the peyote. You're in a teepee sitting on your laurels for 12 hours. 12 hours sitting. I haven't sat anywhere for 12 hours. It's hard enough for me to sit an hour, let alone 12, on the floor. With the heat of the rising sun warming the teepee, the fireman covers the smoldering embers with dirt. People make their way into the open air. I stand up, my knees creaking, ankles sore and aching, and the chunks of peyote scatter over the dirt floor. I freeze, looking around to see if my iniquity has been detected. I drop my sweater on the scattered pieces and coolly stuff them into my pocket. Randy and June are disappointed with me when I complain to them in the refreshing sunlight. That was absolute torture. I had no idea it was going to be so long. You didn't take the peyote, are the first words out of June's mouth. How did they know? Everyone was spaced out, and it was semi-dark in there. I drank the tea. It doesn't matter. The peyote was very vital to the ritual, Jay. That is why they call it Father Peyote, says Randy superciliously. I didn't feel comfortable. Then why did you come in the first place? I really thought I could connect without the drug. It's not a drug. It grows in nature. It's natural. I still just didn't feel comfortable. You disappoint me, Jay. I'm sorry, Randy. Until you learn to have courage and face your inner struggles, you're never going to get where you need to be. Bottom line, I was a bad Indian. I tell them I am tired and need to leave. Everyone has brought food, and this is the potluck socializing time, but I want to duck out, go home and sleep. That's all I can think about. I catch Rick, the road chief, and his sister Glenda's disappointed looks as I shuffle to my car. I try to strike up small talk with them, but they give me the cold shoulder. I try to tell them about seeing the great spirit eagle and being carried a hundred feet off the ground and seeing everything as atoms, but I'm still a dick because I chuck the peyote in the weeds. One other guy also suffers the humiliation and stigma of the outcast. This is the only guy who left the teepee early. He is a young white guy with glasses who looks like a carbon copy of myself. He also says he had the vision of being carried off the ground. Everyone seems to avoid this guy like a leper. He is worse off than me because he left the teepee prematurely and broke the sacred hoop. I drive home, trying mightily to keep myself awake 
and almost dying about seven times from dozing off and drifting over the center line and getting in near head-on collisions with 18 wheelers. I never see Randy and his wife after that. I try to call but he avoids me. I want to apologize and tell him that maybe it was too much for me, but he should have forewarned me about the 12 hours on your ass in a teepee Indian ritual thing. Would have been nice.